Hello, my name is Michelle Walfer and I'm a Delaware Master Gardener. I also work for the University of Delaware College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And on May 9th, I presented um, via in-person and on Zoom, my workshop, Hydrangeas for Delaware. Unfortunately, there was some technical snafus when I got the recording back and actually played it. The sound was cutting in and out. And we'll talk about hydrangeas for Delaware. So the reason I became, I've been growing hydrangeas seriously since 2001. They were my mother's favorite flower. We had a little house in Brigantine, New Jersey, a little 800 square foot beach cottage. And she, they were, when we bought the property, they were surrounded by the blue macrophylla hydrangea. And my mother never killed them. My mother did not have a green thumb. She preferred plastic and silk flowers. But she never killed these. I, in her mind, that made her a gardener. And so I, when my mother passed away in 2001 in March, uh, we surrounded the altar with hydrangeas in her honor. And each of us took a hydrangea home. 2001, I just built a brand new house. I just got hired at Delaware Cooperative Extension and, and the Carvel Center on Route 9. And I planted my first shrub in my brand new house, which was my mother's hydrangea. And I planted it east facing, northeast facing, and or actually southeast facing. Planted it. I did everything wrong that you could do. It was a hothouse or florist hydrangea that had been forced in March, right, to, to look pretty. Well, hydrangeas don't bloom in March, naturally. So it was put in the ground very close to the house. And I'll talk about that later. But when that wasn't performing the way I thought it was going to be, I was determined to learn more about them. And I made a lot of early mistakes. But what you're getting is the fruit of 20, 20 well, 22 years and going on hydrangeas. I went, when I finished my bachelor's degrees, I took 18 credits of plant science. Of course, I'm surrounded by extension experts. And... Um, and I learned from them. And then in 2021, I actually took a formal training to become a master gardener. So I have learned a lot on the way, learned why some of my earlier mistakes were mistakes. So I'm going to impart that with you today. So what we're going to be covering is that there are actually 75 or so separate species of hydrangea. Some of them are quite rare. A lot of them are native to other countries, particularly Asia, but some in the U.S. We're going to talk about the five that are commonly available in Delaware. There is a sixth, which is a climbing hydrangea. And honestly, I, from what I've heard from people who have them, they're very, very persnickety. They take five or six years to bloom before you plant them. They're very heavy. You need a really strong arbor or trellis to do so. I, I don't want to say that they're, it's not available in Delaware. They are. Just understand you're not going to get that showy impact for quite some time. And they're somewhat, and even when they are in bloom, they're not as attractive as the ones that we commonly think of. So the top five in Delaware are the macrophylla, also known as French hydrangea, hortensia. There's cursifolia, which is known as the oak leaves, and they are native. Serrata which is a, a close cousin to, to the macrophylla, but they're grown in the mountainous regions. And we'll talk about those, paniculata, these are the panicles, and then arborescence, which are called smooth hydrangeas. We're gonna talk about the color expectations, where and, and how to plant containers versus in the ground, when and how to prune, this is a big one, and problems and issues. We also are not going to talk about propagating hydrangeas today. If you come to our open house on June 24th, I am conducting a workshop on how to propagate hydrangeas. So definitely come to that if you can. Know your plant zone and your soil chemistry. Some of you watching this may not be from Delaware because it's going to be online or even Delawareans. You may have a vacation home in the mountains or you may have, you may have a place in Maine or Vermont that you go to. So it doesn't always mean that you're going to be in zone 7A and 7B. I live along Lewis, the Lewis area, so I'm 7B. The coast actually uh, makes our 
makes our um, growing zone slightly warmer. And there are pockets of zone 7B up here in northern eastern Wilmington, a little bit in Dover. So there's little microclimates, but generally speaking, we're zone 7. We could be zone A or zone B. I strongly recommend that you know your soil chemistry as well as your zone. Hydrangeas are fussy little plants. They like certain things, but you need to know what you're dealing with. And what drives me crazy when I go online, say Facebook, and people will say, oh, you got to put eggshells underneath. You got to throw coffee grinds. You got to do this. You got to all these old wives tales. You got to add fertilizer. A lot of people, the first thing they say out of their mouth is fertilize it, fertilize it. Well, do you need to do that? There's no reason to spend the money on fertilizer if you, your soil doesn't need it because once it ne has what it needs, giving more, it doesn't help. It actually just leaches into the soil and it's what helps pollutes our waterways. So know what you're dealing with, know what your deficiencies are. I have pockets of different kinds of soil in my property. I have soil that's alkaline. I have soil that's acidic. I have one part of my section of my soil under a lot of layland trees that the, the acidity was like three, five and 0.4, super, super acidic. So I had to line that before I planted any hydrangeas. So you need to know what you're dealing with. They're $17. You can go online to this link and they do a comprehensive test. It's not just a pH test. And uh, it takes two or three weeks to do so or to get the results back. So it's very, very important. Right off the bat, let's talk about pruning because pruning and improper pruning is the number one reason your traditional macrophyllas will not bloom. It's the number one. What's wrong with my hydrangea? I pruned it and it's still not blooming. Well, you pruned it, that's why. So you never, ever, 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 ever prune a macrophylla, a cursifolia, or a serrata. The only caveat to that is let's say something a windstorm broke off a major branch or I used to have a great Dane and when he would run around the yard he would break branches because he's a big dog right something happens to the hydrangea and now your your shrub is lopsided or maybe you just moved into a home where the hydrangea you don't know what kind it is you don't know how old it is but it's overgrowing your window or it's overgrowing a pathway then you need to do some corrective pruning and some shape reshaping if you are going to do that, if you, the safest time is in the month, really the month of July, but from July 15th to August 15th, I would even, now that I'm thinking about it, even narrow that to just July, early August, um, because that's when the plant is resting in August and in September. These top three, the, the macrophylla, the cursifolia, and the serrata, start to set their blooms in the leaf nodes for next year. So this August, September, 2024's blossoms will be created. If you cut that shrub off, you're cutting all of the blossoms that you would have gotten in 2024. I hope that makes sense. Deadheading is something different. Deadheading is just getting directly underneath the bud that's maybe gotten old and dry. And if you don't like that look, you can snip those off. That's fine, but you don't want to do an overall pruning. If you have a landscaping company, your landscape owner may know that, but the person they just hired this summer to work may not. So you really want to make sure that you tell your landscape or your contractors, these top three are not to be pruned, period, end of story. They're going to have sticks and canes, and we'll talk about that, but you really, they need to be left alone, and they will have periods of time where they want to rest they'll take off a year they go on vacation and then next year that they, they come back like crazy so, so the, they're a little bit persnickety the other thing that that the reason they won't bloom is due to weather and we'll talk about that but the lower two the aborescence which is native and the panicles you don't have to prune them but they will absolutely thrive and be very thankful that you did and the best time to prune them in Delaware zone is around St. Pat. I am Irish, so I pick St. Patrick's Day, but somewhere around mid-March, even as late as April 1, they can be pruned and they should be pruned back by about one third or even one half. And it looks drastic. 
They're just going to be a bunch of bare sticks. You're going to come in and you're going to cut them and you're going to cut them on the diagonal right above a leaf node. And I'll show you what that is. And you think you've destroyed your plant, but it will come back like gangbusters. It will, you'll, if you don't prune it and you don't have to, if you don't prune it, you'll get just as many flowers, but they'll be littler and smaller as opposed to fewer, but gigantic, especially with the panicles and the, uh, the smooth hydrangeas. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So here's, this is the macrophylla. This is the one we mostly think of, and these are the, some of the terms that it goes by, that they go by. General characteristics, they're native to Asia, they're deciduous, so they're gonna lose all their leaves. That doesn't make them a great front of, front of the house foundation plant. If you're gonna have a hedge of macrophyllas in the front of your house, understand that you're gonna be looking at bear canes six to seven months out of the year. That might not be the look you want. They prefer, and this is true, I think almost any plant that you buy, they prefer soil that's rich in hummus, compost, moist, but draining. If you're going to dig a new hole for a new hydrangea, or if you're going to transplant one, I have my, I don't dig because I have hip problems. I have my husband dig a hole. I fill it with water and I watch how fast that water drains out. If you come back an hour later and there's still a lot of water in that soil, I'm close to the shore, but I have a lot of clay pockets in my in my yard. And it's almost like just putting your hydrangea in a bucket without any drainage holes. So you want to look at that. And if you have that type of condition, you want to dig a deeper and wider hole than you think you need. You want to add in compost, potting soil, soil that you removed when you were digging and possibly some soil amendments like we're not supposed to endorse anything but leaf grow that comes in bags you can get them in a big box store the orange big box store um, and that's a nice soil amendment that's made from composted leaves mix all that in and set that new plant in a nice cushy bed of hummus humus soil they're going to love it they're going to thank you for it so many people just dig a hole. This is the size of my pot. I dig a hole. This is the size of the pot. I put the, I put, take it out of the pot, put it in. You're essentially putting it from one pot to another if you don't break up and deepen the soil around it. Hydrangeas hate heat. Regardless of how often you water them, they will wilt if they are exposed to 80 or 90 degree heat for, for an extended period of time. They do well when they're left alone and resist the urge to prune them. The very baby blooms, you will start to see them and they're just tiny little, about the half size of half a dime, will start emerging in April. And they get wider and bigger. By May, by late May, you, start, you might start to see they're about the size of a lemon maybe, but flat. And there you might see hints of color. And then by June, and then by June 15th to July 15th, they are in peak bloom. So that's when you're going to see them, you know, looking splendiferous. Um, they'll last about a month in, that can, in ideal conditions. If it's super hot and super sunny, those blossoms are going to shrivel up and brown up very, very quickly. Some people don't like the look of an aged blossom. I personally do. A lot of my macrophyllas start to fade, but they look very like someone's come in and painted them with watercolors and they'll shift to muted greens and muted pinks and muted oranges. And, and I think they're very, very lovely. And then eventually they just turn brown. Some people leave them up on their shrubs over winter because the snow will collect on them and um, some don't. Most of the hydrangeas in this category will shift from blue to pink or pink to blue, depending on your soil chemistry. It is not just pH. People say, oh, if you make the soil acidic, there has to be aluminum sulfate in the soil naturally, or you can add it. You can't extract aluminum <laughs> sulfate though. At least I don't, certainly don't know how to. So when you are buying container soil or potting soil in a bag, that generally is much more alkaline or neutral. I have had blue hydrangeas that I bought. If I plant them in a container, will turn pink. That's the only time they go from blue to pink. 
they most often go from pink to 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 blue in my yard anyway and it does this over time if you're bent on having pink hydrangeas and you bought blue then you're going to have to keep um, you're going to have to rather if you bought a pink one and you want it to stay pink you're probably best off leaving it in a container and grow it in a container there are some exceptions um summer crush is one summer crush will stay pink no matter what um so you need to know what your soil chemistry is if you want to keep them blue pinks will sometimes turn to purple which is a lovely color and sometimes you get a combination of pink and purple and blue all on the same plant and that's just because the roots are sprawling out right and they're tapping into pockets that are more alkaline than uh, and other pockets that are more acidic so i kind of just let nature take its course and see what my yard uh, what the combinations happen but you can manipulate it a little bit sometimes you need to apply that chemical all of the time that additive to keep to keep it on the acidic side so this now there are two types of inflorescence. I I laugh sometimes when people post a picture of the picture on the right and say, I bought this hydrangea, but what's wrong with it? It's not blooming correctly. And I'll go in there and say, no, 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 it's actually a very beautiful, very lovely lace cap. So within the macrophylla family, there are the globular or mop head shapes, which you see on the left. And this is Mathilda Gooch's, that's the variety name of that. And over on the left, I believe this is Zorro, this is a lace cap. So you have those choices. I think they're both stunning. I've bought some that were labeled thinking they were one and I got the other. So that will happen too if you buy a lot of hydrangeas, make sure the label's correct. Then you have within those two categories, you could have a old wood blooming, old fashioned that blooms only on old wood. And you could or have a hybrid which blooms on both old and new wood and new wood. So it's like, oh my gosh, now I've got four different kinds of ways that this these hydrangeas are going to, to grow. And so it gets a little confusing. Most, I will say, most of the lace caps that I have are rebloomers, which means they bloom on old wood and new wood. My, I have 108 hydrangeas in my property. I'm a crazy lady. The most of my uh, my mop heads are half and half. So I have some rebloomers. I have some very old fashioned ones. Well, how do you know if they're rebloomers or not? You want to look at even on old wood. So the old wood here is brown. And you see there's new growth growing out of that, off of that old wood right here. You see that? So that's blooming on old wood. But now look at this. This is, this is old wood, but now I have all this new growth. And you're going to have new growth off of old wood. So how do I know if this is a rebloomer? If there's a bloom in here, and if, if I bent that leaf back, you would see a little blossom in that. So that's blooming on green wood. If it's blooming on green wood, it is a rebloomer. So you can cut this off at a leaf node down below, and you would get new growth coming off of this old cane, where all of your new growth will come off, will look more like this on an old wood. It's a little confusing. I still sometimes second guess myself on what I've got. So you want to look at the labels. If you see trade names for these would be um, Tough Stuff is usually, at, let's say, um, Proven Winners will have Tough Stuff. They will say so on, a, on their label. Um, another one is Endless Summer. Of course, I think everybody's heard that. There's another trade name called Forever and Ever, and they have a whole line with under that category. Um, Let's Dance is another one that is a macrophylla that is a rebloomer. So a lot of the new ones rebloom. The old wood ones, if you have an old fashioned one, or if you've inherited a house or moved into a house where you have established hydrangeas that appear to be quite mature, I would 
until you know for sure in the blooming season, I would default to it being an old wood bloomer. They set their blooms for the next year in September, August and September. That is why you don't. So if you do want, if you want to have, if you want it to bloom next year, you can't be pruning it because you're going to just prune off all of the future blossoms. So the rule of thumb here is to never prune them. They are very vulnerable to late spring frost. So in, in Delaware, it's crazy weather in March and April. We could have three days of 70 degree weather, right? And so your, your plants, which have the little buds and little leaves on them, they, they think, wow, it's, it's May outside. I'm going to start growing. And so they kick in and they start, the buds start to swell, the leaf nodes start to swell, the leaves start to come out and they are being tricked by the weather into thinking it's warmer and far along in the spring than it actually is. And then boom, cold spell comes through or a late frost. We had a late frost in 2023 here in Lewis and I, I had to go outside and cover my shrubs with blankets and tablecloths and things like that because I didn't want the frost to, you know, those buds had, had been tricked into growing a little bit. And then this frost will come in and will fry them. And I'll show you what that damage looks like. So you have to be very careful when you deadhead an old hydrangea not to take the leaf nodes off that are underneath. You want to save them because that's where your blossoms are going to be. The new wood, um, your endless summers, and they could be tricky too. Some people call them endless bummers because they don't quite perform. Um, if you pr accidentally prune them, you're going to get half of them are going to come back because they will bloom on new wood, just like the panicles and the arbor arborescents do. They tend to rebound if they, you have a really bad cold snap in, in March or April, two or three days of you know, freezing weather. Um, it won't kill a reblooming hydrangea. It won't, it will you'll still get something out of it where it would it would be a death knell to the to the old wood. Then there's a difference with why the hydrangea is grown in the first place. And I ask you to look at these two purple hydrangeas and what's the difference in them? Well, one, one is grown, the one on the left, proven winners, and also Monrovia and La Summer, Forever and Ever, ones that have trade names with labels inside. Those have been grown over periods of time. Uh, proven winners have breeders, they have PhDs, they have botanists that work in labs to develop shrubs that will endure, that have specific characteristics for the landscape. So I want to make sure I only want a dwarf variety. Well, they have, and through breeding, know that X, X cultivar will only go two feet high, or X cultivar will stay pink no matter what, or X cultivar is cold hardy. And how do they know that? Well, they use, um, we don't do it for hy their hydrangeas. We do it for their annuals, but proven winter contracts with different land grant universities and different growers all over the country. And these are field tested two, three, four, five years before they are released to the market. And so when it tells you this will be hardy from zone five to zone seven or zone four to zone seven, it will be hardy. You can safely plant that in the ground. It's not going to get eight feet tall if it says it will grow between three and four feet. So you really want to read that label and you know what you're getting. You, you're going to get a plant that's going to rebloom or not rebloom or grow tall or not grow tall or stay a certain color or shift to a certain color. So all of this is bred in. And it's why they're expensive. It's why you can pay up to $50, $60 for some. I bought one. Uh, my husband and I honeymooned in Cape May. And I saw Monrovia has a seaside serenade series. And one was called Cape May. Well, I had to get it, right? I just had to get it because of a sentimental Cape May. Well, it was like $75 plant. But you're paying for their research. You're paying for the reliability that this shrub Certain shrubs can tolerate more sun than others. And the label will tell you that because they've proven this out. 
Now, the other one on the right is what I maybe, and I've received these for Mother's Day. When my mother passed away in March, this was the kind of hydrangea that we bought to, to put around the altar. These are grown, I would say, think of them the way we think of poinsettias that we get in the winter, right? We get them, we, we enjoy them, but after the, the red, the, the, the petals, the flowers go away, some of us might try and grow them, but they never really bloom again. We don't have a climate for that here. They have to have X number of hours of darkness and degree days and everything else. So they're meant as a bouquet. They're, it's a living bouquet, but then they're meant to be tossed. Now, hot house hydrangeas, florist hydrangeas are, are grown in perfect greenhouse conditions, as are actually the proven winners ones. So when you buy them in the store, usually I would recommend with the cultivated one on the left that you don't buy one in full bloom like that. If you see one like this in April or May, it's been triggered to be showy early so that you'll buy it, right? Wow, look at that. I look for plants. I look for shrubs of the landscape that have baby blooms on them, just about ready to start. And you want to buy them in May and they're just tiny little guys. But if you buy a fully bloomed shrub like that in April or May, it's been forced to bloom early. So when you get in the landscape, they're going to dry up pretty fast. They're going to, they're on their way down as far as their inflorescence is concerned. And they'll rebound back and they'll sink up to what they should be doing in nature after that. But these florist hydrangeas are, you know, you can you can buy a, a hydrangea like that in February. Well, you can't plant it in the ground and expect that it's it's going to do that. They are also, they don't have any bred into them, any of the endurance traits. So these hydrangeas um, are not going, they can perform and they can be planted in your yard and they can, I prefer, I would strongly urge that they do better as container hydrangeas as opposed to in the ground hydrangeas, number one. Number two, if you plant them in the ground, like I did with my mother's bouquet, they're going to grow and they're going to leaf out. Mine were orangey pink when they were faded orangey pink when I finally planted them in the ground in April. And those faded and I expected that. The next year, it doubled in size. It did not bloom. Third year, it doubled again in size and did not bloom. In the fourth year, the buds came out and it was showy and beautiful and glorious for about five or six years. Then we built an addition onto the house. So now the, the shrub was in a little bit more of a microclimate. There, it, it, this addition blocked side winds from coming in. It blocked air circulation. And our summer started getting hotter. And I found that that shrub wilted first in the heat. It hated the sun. It received morning sun, but it, it got sun until like one o'clock before the sun started coming over the other side of our roof. Then it broke. But, you know, from, from eight till, till one, that's what, five hours of strong sun, it started to suffer. And every year I put shade cloth over it. One year it was so bad. All of the blossoms were there in May and it looked beautiful. And then the end of May, we had like a hot heat spell. It was in the 90s. So there is a difference. And I've already explained this. So, and you're going to have access to all of these presentations. So you can go back and read these. 90 degrees from like late Memorial Day weekend through to like June seventh so it was like two weeks of intense heat like you expect to get in august right we were getting it and my shrub just turned into a chocolate chip cookie shrub and, and they weren't tasty and it wasn't appetizing looking so i decided to dig that 20 year old hydrangea up and move it we'll talk about that but you just have to be careful with these on the right um i personally recommend that you put them in a large ceramic container, put them out on your back patio under a tree. They're going to do very, very well. Then you have to bring them in in the winter. They will not survive outside in the cold in a container. So there is a difference. 
and that I've already, already explained this. So, and you're going to have access to all of these presentations, so you can go back and read these. Okay, the canes, the bare sticks. What do I do about them? This is Edward Scissor's hands. Don't be Edward. Leave these canes alone. So this was last year on the side of my house. I had these hydrangeas. An interesting story about this particular row. I had in mind, I planted these about 15 years ago. And I had in mind, I think, Annabelle's, you know, the, the white big snowball uh, arborescence hydrangeas. But I didn't know the difference. I just wanted some a long row of white ones. So I went to Lowe's for this one. I bought one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hydrangeas. The front one was one, three of them were mislabeled. So I got two lace caps out of it and I got one very interesting um, mixed color I'll show you. So there was that, but that's okay. I like surprises. But the main thing here is these canes. People get upset when they see these. And they go, oh, and this is an old, this is not a rebloomer. This is the old wood blooming hydrangea. But it, I didn't do anything with them. I left them alone. And this is what I got two months later. So be careful about being cane happy and trying to prune them. Now, as they age, they get very gray, they get wide, and they, they get hollow. And sometimes you can just go up to them and tug on them and they'll pop and the canes will pop out. That's fine. But there's another issue we have in, in our zone is there is an insect called the hydrangea cane borer. And what it's looking for, and some of these canes, they may not produce. And you can see here as they, as they bloom, there were some that didn't produce anything. There's one, look, right there. They didn't produce anything, but they still have viability to them. They, you could bend them. They didn't you know, snap off. So as a result, when you cut those, you're leaving a fresh cut, a fresh hit the inside xylem and phloem of, of the cane. You're leaving that exposed to hydrangea cane borers and they will attack. They look for a cane that they can bore into. And thank you very much. You've just given them a nice fresh opening. You've opened the door and invited them in. And what they do, and I'll show you pictures of it later, they, they eat the xylem and the phloem, they dig it out, they put it, you'll see white flakes um, on the leaves here. And that means that they've been digging down and they can dig down, 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 they can go down 16 inches. Um, and I'll talk about how, how to correct that. But it wouldn't have happened at all if I hadn't pruned them. The safest time to prune these out is in July because it's not producing buds yet. And the life cycle of that insect has come and gone. Changing color. So this was one of the mistakes. I thought I was buying a white hydrangea. When it bloomed that year, it bloomed pink. And then the next year it came in, it came through as blue, blue and, or blue and cream. And that's because of the soil chemistry. So I had some aluminum sulfate in my soil. pH will affect the uptake of the aluminum sulfate. If you don't have aluminum sulfate in your soil, you can, you can change the pH all you want. It's not gonna change color. So the two have to exist, high or low pH and aluminum sulfate in the soil. My mother used to say, oh, you push down pennies into the soil, that will change them. And I think they would think that anything metallic or will, will make the, um, so aluminum, I guess it's a metal, so there was probably some correlation with that, but that's not going to do it. it, it you have to have that aluminum. You can buy aluminum sulfate. A spoma sells it. It's called a blue acidifier. Um, and that will help your, um, your pink hydrangeas to turn blue. It's a little harder to do it the other way around. If I had wanted this to stay this color, I would have dug it up and put it in a giant pot. But then I'd have to worry about overwintering it. There are quite a few. I only picked a few. Merit Supreme is old one, Nico Blue, Mathilda Gucci's, all of your endless summers, your Bloomstruck, Summer Crush, and that does stay pink, your Proven Winners Let's Dance, um, your Seaside Serenade series from Monrovia. 
and forever and ever. And this peppermint was the one that um, I just showed you that went from pink to blue. This is um, the ones I bought along the fence. I was thinking Incredibles or Arborensis, Annabelle, but instead I got a Macrophylla. And this is called Schneeball, which is um, translates in German to snowball. It's not the same as there, there is one called the wedding gown. There's one called blood, bri bridal, bridal plot. There's different names that have to do with weddings. They'll be macrophyllas that are white. These will not change color. They don't get particularly attractive when they age. They start to brown around the edges. You can see a little bit of it starting here. So they don't age as well. I think if I had to do it all over again, I would have would have put in Incredibles all down that fence line, but they are pretty. This has a nice ruffled edge to it. Some hydrangea macrophylas have, uh, have smooth edges. And this has very, very dark leaves, very dark forest, forest green. This is called pistachio, also known as Horwack. Um, I have three of them. They're very particular about where they are planted. They like a little bit more sun than a traditional macrophylla. They are slow growing. But if you want a little pop of color, and I would say I put them in the dwarf category. So you could plant them in front of a flower bed that gets maybe a little bit more sun. They didn't bloom at all in full shade where I originally had them. I've moved two of them in three different places. And finally, and I'll tell you a story. I had them on the southern side of my house, but protected by a big river birch. I ended up having to cut the river birch down, which panicked and freaked out all of my other hydrangeas. But these just said, hey, we love this extra sun. Thank you. And they started to do really well. So you got to kind of pair up, <coughs> excuse me, your hydrangeas. I would say these do well alongside the arborescence hydrangea. And they do well next to um, oak leaves because oak leaves, although oak leaves like shade, they also, because they're native, can tolerate a little bit, little bit more sun. Not full sun, not afternoon sun, but they can go, um, if you've got a little pocket of sunshine that's peeping through, these would be nice. What I love about them is the color is color fast. No matter where I plant them, they all have this pinky, shrimpy, blue, sherbet as well like I would think an assorted sherbet color and I think they're quite quite beautiful this is merit supreme so this is the first year this is almost how I bought it right out of the pot I came in and you can see my yard it's, it's very I don't have a I don't have any grass in my yard I have an MO backyard so I planted this on the southern side of my house but shielded by a very very large river birch tree so it seemed to like its home. So this is what it looked like the first year. This is what it looked like the second year. So you can see the color shift, right? I have acidic soil and I have obviously have some aluminum sulfate in my soil. And so here you have pink and purple on some branches. Some have just gone totally purple. And this is the third year of the same shrub. It's shifting more towards blue now. So it's really accessing that aluminum sulfate in the soil. And I will tell you, when we cut down our river birch, this shrub suffered. Uh, it's just now coming back. It protested last year, was its first full year in full, roughly basically full sun, and it suffered, suffered badly. I've since bought umbrellas and tried to protect it. I'm getting four blooms this year from the shrub. So it's going to come back and I'm planting other trees to help try and shade this. The other option I would have is to dig it up and try to put it in a shadier spot. But if you change the environment on them, that's what happens. So this is Zorro. This is a lace cap. Also another popular one is Twist and Shout. You'll see those. Um, there's some that have black stems on them. Those are definitely reed bloomers. This one is a reed bloomer, but it's called Zorro. And these are two mistakes. These are at the end of that fence line I was telling you about. 
Uh, I thought I was buying nine white ones. These were mixed in and I thought they were the same. They didn't have labels to indicate they weren't. And they ended up being lace caps. And what's really interesting is this one is all blue. And I don't know the variety because they weren't, they didn't have a label. And these over here, they're side by side. These are purple. But they're quite lovely and I'm delighted by the, by the surprise. This is peppermint. This is forever and ever peppermint. So this is the other mistake from Lowe's mislabeled. And by the way, these spots are called lenticels. They are normal. And if you see them along your new growth, that's right. Right there is a good example. That's perfectly normal. That's what you want to see on a healthy stem. But these have stayed reliably um, blue and white. I just think they're lovely. And it is a reblooming plant. <clears throat> this is Summer Crush. Slow growing in my house. Um, I don't know if anybody else has it. Had I, had I to do it over again, I think I would have bought maybe, you know, a big 10 gallon pot or for it and maybe planted it that way. It has a rebloomed. Um, it gets a little bit more sun. It gets afternoon sun coming in here about three o'clock and then it goes away. Um, but it has stayed pink when all the other hydrangeas around this have turned blue this has stayed pink so if you if you want that pop of pink and i do because all mine turned blue this is um but it's a little bit more slow growing this is mathilda gucci's and it has ruffled edges you can see the ruffles right here and there's another picture of the lenticels and this is just a stunner love it um relatively deep shade this is a variegated hydrangea and if you'll notice on my shrub here, you'll see new growth that gets sun. This gets noonday sun it is not variegated, but down below where it's being shaded by the top growth, it has stayed variegated. And this is uh, Marisi or Mar Marisi I, um, highly susceptible. This is old fashioned, super, super easy to propagate. I have it has low growing branches. It propagated itself actually. And I cut it off and I had a whole new plant. Very easy to propagate, extremely susceptible to frost, frost and cold damage. So this is the shrub that I will run out and cover in March and April when they say it's going to get 33 degrees outside. I'll go out and throw a tablecloth on it. And, uh, protect it because it will brown it does it's never killed it the shrub will still blossom but it will um it's just very very tender up up at the top where it's exposed but that's the um inflorescence of it very pretty i have a friend who grows has the same shrub in bethany beach and hers blooms pink and there is a new variety i think it's called lemonade or lemon something but the instead of white it's yellow so it's green and yellow and it's also very pretty and udbg gardens has one as well in their in their garden this is called nico blue and that pack of sandra you see at the bottom once i became knowledgeable and about native plants i dug that all out that that is invasive so that's not there anymore but this is nico blue this is old-fashioned uh, variety blooms on old wood. You see Nico blue a lot if you ever go into a hardware store, a big box store, you know, where they sell the blueberry plants uh, in these cardboard columns. Oftentimes you'll see Nico blue sold that way as a bare root. This came, and this is where this came from. This was originally like a $9 bare root plant that is probably 20 years old now. And uh, this particular plant is facing southwest, which is a big mistake. Didn't know what I was doing 20 years ago. However, um, I have since planted other trees that have grown quite tall and, and break that sun up. So it's doing better every year. It's doing better. But this particular shrub is more, if I cut this off to put in a vase, it's the first one that will will droop. It tends to be droopy in the heat. I water it um, in, because it's southwest facing. I will water it in the morning and also again in the afternoon. Um, I tried to shade the roots, but I've since now just have black mulch there. 
but it's a very pretty variety. And um, in some soils, it's even a deeper blue, but this is more, for me, it's, it's a powder blue color. And this is one that would change, even though it's called Nico blue, it will change to pink if, if it's alkaline. But very few people have a 100% alkaline soil with no um, aluminum sulfate in it. So I think if you buy this, it's going to pretty much stay blue. Cursifolas. These are the oak leaf hydrangeas, and they are fast becoming my favorite of the hydrangeas. They are native to the southeast, so perfect for Delaware. I had eight of them in my prop on my property, and all are doing well. I've um, purchased this is general characteristics of it is it's native, it's deciduous, it grows and it has the same pruning characteristics as macrophyllus. So it likes partial shade, morning sun, afternoon shade. Don't prune it ever. Doesn't, and if you do have to prune it, it, follow that same rule as the macrophyllus. It changes color as it ages from white. And I'll show you what some of that looks like. This is Gatsby Pink. This, it, this particular shrub is about 15 years old in my house. This was two years ago before I changed my fence. But this is about eight foot tall. And the inflorescence on it is not tight. The, the, the um, fertile flowers are in between the bigger white sterile flowers. The bees go nuts over this. Now, if you notice, it's grown over into this pathway. So what I did with this plant is in late July, I came in and cut and prune back kind of all of this area in here so that I could have, oops, easier access to it. So as it, ate, oh, there it goes. As I'm touching my mouse and it's freaking me out because it's being sensitive. As it ages, it looks like what you see down below on the right. It, um, the blossoms, the sterile flowers become pink and they are dangly. And, um, the shift to pink is, is very dependent on keeping it well watered uh, in late July and August so that it will, otherwise it will go right from straight white, straight. It doesn't, the heat won't affect it, but it will go from white to brown immediately if you don't keep it well watered during that transition time. This one's not my photograph, but this is Ruby Slippers. So this, at when it ages, turns pink more reliably, and it only grows to about three or four feet. So it's in that dwarf category. It's not going to be a monster like this one. It's going to stay quite small. This is um, Gatsby Moon. I just bought this, so I can't attest to it, but I love the way the panicle looks on that. It almost looks like a limelight hydrangea but with oak leaves. So I'm really excited about this one. I have it in relatively um, deep shade. It gets a couple spatterings of afternoon sun to it, but the rabbits love it. I will tell you that I had to put a cage around it because uh, it's a young plant and it's low to the ground. And I saw branches just kind of broken off laying on the ground. And that's, in, and I've seen a lot of rabbits this year. This is Alice. And Alice is the largest, not in terms of, well, it will get tall, it'll get big and wide and tall. I've had mine for about four years, but it's big in terms of its scale. My hand fits, like my thumb is there and my fingers are here. That's how big these leaves are. It's very dramatic. The panicle is at least 14, 15, 16 inches long. Uh, this took a, a year off last year. This, I had it, this is my fourth year. This was the second year. Then last year, it did not bloom at all. It's decided, I don't want to. <laughs> and that happens. And I didn't panic. I just said, okay, be like that. I'm just going to, I'm still, I'm still your friend. I'm still going to take care of you. I fertilized it, watered it. And it just needed a year to, to grow and to leaf out. And this year, I have about eight or nine panicles. So this is just going to now do better and better and better as it grows, but it's very dramatic 
Um, I would leave it off by itself so people could see it. This is Snow Queen. And um, I took this in May. I will tell you now, uh, if I'll, um, as I edit this, I'll edit in the, um, the image of what it looks like now. This guy is in full sun, doesn't get any shade at all. And it, it's grown like gangbusters. This is four years old and look at it. It's just, boom, and it's loaded with blossoms. And uh, this is also Snow Queen. So this is another one that I have in more shade. And then the Snow Queen will turn. So this turns like into a pretty lime color, sagey lime. And then it ages over into pink. And then, so the mixture of the lime and the pink, I think is stunning. And then it will turn brown. And then the chocolate brown, like a Hershey, Hershey chocolate, you could sip those off. They look beautiful in the fall in your mantle or in a fall decoration. And the leaves turn quite beautiful. Um, the pollinators love oak leaves. So this is the Gatsby pink here. This is a snow queen. This is also a snow queen. Now, and it's pro probably here, this is probably late September. So you can see it's starting to chocolate up a little bit. And then look at the foliage. You don't get this with any other hydrangea. So this is why I recommend them. Um, so even as they age, I think the blossoms are interesting there. It's totally brown there. It's that beautiful cocoa color but the leaves are just stunning on them. So um, they tend to be completely trouble-free. They get a little a bit of the circospocia spots uh, on the leaves, but nothing that's fatal, nothing you really have to worry about too much. They are trouble-free. And because they're native, I highly recommend them. Serrata. Serrata are mountain hydrangeas. So they are native, uh, the mountain regions of Asia. They're a little bit twiggier than the macrophylla, the cane side. They don't really have the canes. They're more twigs than, than those thicker canes. They're easy to, to propagate because of that, because a lot of the canes will lay down on the ground and they, they can root themselves. So, But in every other way, they operate the same way as a macrophylla and should be treated the same. A lot of them will change their colors this is Tough Stuff Aha, but really cool. This one's called Gray Wood, and these start out totally white. The petals, the, the, this is the fertile part of the flower, and these are the sterile part. And these change color from white to pink to, to blues and purples, and it's just, it's quite stunning. This is Tough Stuff Red. So this was the first year, bought it in the ground. It's got a little bit of slug damage this year, but it goes from a pale pink to a deeper, not really red, but more of a fuchsia color. And my Cape May Serenade, this was like a $75 or $80 plant. A lot of the serratas, by the way, have purpling in the leaves and that's normal, that's common. But it is a lace cap, purely bought on impulse just because it was called Cape May. If they, call, if they named one after the Beatles, I'd have to go out and buy a Paul, John, George, and Ringo one too. I mean, I just buy things for the silliest reasons. But paniculatas, now these are the panicle hydrangeas. And these are the ones that you want to plant if you've got a lot of sunshine and if you, it will tolerate the heat. So they're really ideal for Delaware because our summers are getting hotter. They come in a range of varieties and cultivars, a range of sizes. And so too many to name, but I've named a couple of them. These thrive along with the arborescence if you prune them in mid-March. So think, I'm Irish, think St. Patrick's Day. They prefer morning um, sun and afternoon noon shade no these like sun all the time that's that's incorrect they bloom later in the summer july and august so you, they are later than the macrophyllas and just again disregard this that's wrong it, it's the opposite they 
prefer afternoon sun. And they really don't do well in shade at all. So you don't want to put them any place where they get shady. Yeah, they love sun and tolerate heat. So these don't wilt and droop like your macrophyllas will do. If you prune them, you will get large showy blooms. They often emerge as white to lime white. And then, then they age, some age to a full lime color, some age, some stay white like Bobo. A lot of them on the market, and you can, you'll know it by their name, Zinfandel, Berry White, Vanilla Strawberry, Vanilla Sunday, will turn them, uh, Little Lime Punch. They turn pink, magenta, and deep roses. If, if the evening temperature is cooler at night. So in San Francisco, in Massachusetts or Maine, they will turn pink. They may not turn pink in Delaware. I've not seen that catalog pink in my, any of my shrubs. It get, they get hints of it, but not like I, and I think it's because our summers in Delaware at nighttime, they're too hot. It's still too, it's still 85 degrees at night. And if that happens, these aren't going to shift. The other thing too, like with the Gatsby pink oak leaf, you make sure that they're watered during, as, as we turn to fall. Now, but there are some, so this is Bobo. I have Bobo. This is not my Bobo. Um, doesn't look quite like that yet but they are dwarf and they stay, they stay white and then they just go from white to brown. They have no real pretty transition color, but they're really, really nice and they're compact. And again, after your regular hydrangeas are starting to, to fade out, these emerge July and August and look quite lovely. This is Little Quick Fire. So this is mine on the left. You see it's emerging as white, very delicate, very pretty, I think petals on it. Um, lots of little daintiness going on here. They, they turn pink and then by September, October, they look like this. So they had that fire light to them. So this is little quick fire, little, not so it goes about four foot high. I prune it back and, uh, you can keep it more like three feet. You just have to prune it more aggressively in March. This is limelight. This is, oops. This is limelight. Limelight is the showpiece in the in the panicle category. That here it's growing. I wanted to show it's growing. This is in a shady part of my yard. The they're phototropic. They will art. So this tree, if I had backed it up, you saw the back of it. It's all bent. It's bending towards the sun. It wants the sun. And it's time to bloom. It blooms the same time as crepe myrtles. So if you have crepe myrtles, this is the limelight in the front and the crepe myrtle in the back. Um, I let this go without pruning for about five years. And then I've been pruning it regularly every March 15th. Um, if you don't prune, the, the you'll get just more twiggy or smaller blossoms. But these are, are just completely very, very showy. Uh, this is this is the limelight, what it looks like July 17th and what it looks like on August 5th. So it's a very dense panicle. This is Zinfandel. Well, I have one of these, but mine's only three years old. So I haven't seen this color quite yet, but we'll see what this next summer brings along. This is Pinky Winky. So a much more delicate, feathery type, a lot of spacing in between uh, the inflorescence and it's a very pointy panicle as opposed to say the quick fire had more of a rounded top to it. Arborescence. So this is a native hydrangea and what you see on the in pictured here was uh, one I bought from the Delaware Master Gardeners about eight years ago. It faces east, northeast, a little bit more sun and it might get, I have a lot of tall trees you can see here and all of all further down off camera are more, more trees or Leyland cypresses. So it shades this a bit. It probably would be more inflorescent if it had a little bit more sun. It can take that morning sun. So if you can get strong morning sun 
these will do really well. There's one issue with the arborescence is they tend to flop. The blooms are large, and if they get wet, they bend. Breeders took that plant and improved it, and we'll show you. But these are deciduous, all like all hydrangeas, uh, and they thrive with the morning pruning. Um, they emerge as line and then go to full white. There are now a lot of categories that are called blush or mauve. So that instead of white, they stay pink. This is incredible. So this is my house. I have these planted uh, setting the sun, but I have some large uh, gold, gold mop, gold mop cypresses in the back that kind of block the full harsh sun. But these get the size of those paper plates, you know, the white paper plates with the ruffled edges that kids do arts and crafts with. They get that size. They get giant. It's an improved, uh, proven winners took these and improved the stem strength. So it's important to uh, know that if you prune, you prune out all the twiggy branches, you prune the, here's another picture of it, just giant, um, giant, giant blossoms. And they're longer lasting than the macrophyllum. So this will stay, if it's kept watered well, um, stay interesting and I would say pretty well into um, August, but they will start to brown at the edges if it, if it gets a lot of strong heat to it, strong sun. So here's an example here. This was when I first got them. This was out of the out of the pot. This is the second year. This is maybe a year. This is about two years ago because that fence has been changed. But that's what they do. And that's after I prune them. And when I prune them, I'm going to come in right here, cut, 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 cut. And it's you're just going to see a thing of sticks. But that makes this next year look like this over here on the right. So you really want to prune them if you can. Um, yeah, so that's. That's incredible. And they make an incredible blush. Same exact flower, but it is pink and rose colored. Now I've just bought two of these. I can't wait to see them do well. So here, here they were when I first got them. This fence has been replaced. This hydrangea was a $7 Walmart rescue. I've since moved it. I reworked this whole area here. But these I stayed. So that's the way they were when I bought them. You can see there's the container that they came in. And this is what they look like now. This was my old fence torn down. We put a four foot black aluminum fence across. You can see how far they extend up and over. And that's after pruning. So they were pruned probably down to about two feet. So they all this is all brand new growth just this year. This is arborescence cross halo, is a rare lace cap arborescence or a wild hydrangea. You will have access to Mount Cuba study. Mount Cuba Center in Hokessen did a five year trial on wild hydrangeas or native hydrangeas in the arborescence category. They're now doing a study on oak leaves. I can't wait for that to come out. But this is particular shrub was one they recommend rated very, very highly for attracting pollinators, beneficial to pollinators. So I went, oh my God, I got to have one. So I looked all over locally, couldn't find anybody had a hostel. I never heard of them. So I found one. I paid about $40 for this to get it shipped to me. This is its second year in the ground. And it's just it's doing twice as well this year. It's just lovely. I pruned this this year. So I went in and cut just above the leaf node. So this is a leaf node right here. It's where the leaves are coming out of the stem. So I just went in there and cut on a diagonal and diagonal because you don't want any water laying on top. You don't want a bead of water sitting on top of that cut. So I've always been told to cut on a diagonal just above a leaf node and if a branch is growing this way, I might trim that out. But 
you want to keep, and this is just doing, doing well, doing very well. And the report that you'll have access to from Mount Cuba says the same thing. They really thrive uh, and are invigorated by pruning. They also say that this particular shrub does really, really well in sun as well as shade. Now this is facing south, but I have a giant poly in front of it that is casting shadow on it. And you can see there's some shadow in there. So it's not getting beat to death by sun, but I've since bought another one of these and planted it in less protected area that's gonna get about six hours of sun. And I'll report back on that and see how it does. But according to Mount Cuba Center, this is just an all around you know, must have in your garden. So you're starting to see them now in, in garden centers. Hydrangeas do very, very well in con containers. Don't be stingy with the container. These are actually, I think, even a little too small. Um, this is Let's uh, Proven Winners, Let's, Let's Dance, Mr. Blue Jangles. I've since planted him in the ground. This is the Tough Stuff Aha. Uh -huh. You want to make sure that the containers are have a hole in the bottom or like this one doesn't, the container that's inside does, and I've raised it up so that it can, water can drain out. Um, if you do containers, um, you need to bring, be able to bring them in. In our zone, the, you cannot allow the soil inside and the roots inside the containers to freeze. So you either have to insulate them really well or you bring them in. My husband, bless his, bless his heart, gets a dolly and moves all of these. And he gives up his truck space in our double garage. He keeps the truck outside and all of these hydrangeas get brought in into my our unheated garage. But it rarely, if ever, freezes in there. I step down the watering maybe every three weeks, four weeks, I'll put a cup of water in there but you don't want them to fill up with water and then it gets really, really cold. Um, it's getting, our garage gets ambient heat from the house. If you don't have an attached garage, you're gonna to have to do something to protect them from freezing, possibly put pots in a bigger box and pack it with straw and then maybe put some plastic over top, vent it a little bit just so the water doesn't get into that container and then freeze and one crack your pot would also kill your plant. So lots of dwarf varieties. So if you live in a condo and you, you want to have um, some hydrangeas, it's a little tricky because you still have to have that issue about overwintering them. They, they aren't house plants. They can't be brought inside. They need to go dormant. They need to feel the cold. They need to lose their leaves in fall go cold and dormant the winter and reemerge. They need that just like daffodils need that. You So they aren't house plants. But if you have a patio, you could put a box around them and wrap them and insulate them so, they, so that water doesn't get into that soil and then it freezes and kills them. But there's lots of varieties that if you want to have something out on your deck or you could put them in the ground, then you don't have to worry about that. But if you just want that smaller profile, so maybe in the back of, in the front of a larger bed where you may have a big leaf way in the back in the corner, you could put a smaller one in the front. So Proven Winners has a wee series, wee whites, um, mini mauvettes, anything like that. It's gonna say that in the name. Bobo is a dwarf one, but little this, little that. It's gonna tell you that they're little. I will tell you that the little line can get six feet tall. So if you want to keep them little, you really need to early on prune them back in March to keep them in that three foot range. Um, mini penny, buttons and bows. Um, in the oak leaf category, there is ruby slippers. There's also one called munchkin. And those don't get large like the snow queens do. Um, you want to pick containers that are going to be easily moved so that you can move them to a safe place where they won't freeze. I'm going to possibly, because my husband and I are getting up in years and, and my addiction to hydrangeas isn't abating any anytime soon. So we're getting to a point where we 
moving them all into the garage is going to be a is going to be a production. So I may look into doing something like this. But what I don't like about I like this area here. This I really like because this is going to protect. You want to create, in so many words, you want to create a greenhouse for it, but also insulate it so that it doesn't have a deep freeze and keep the rain and the snow from accumulating in there. And then when it gets a little warmer, it gets in there and then it free, then you have a hard freeze again. You you've given your hydrangeas a death knoll. So you have to protect it from the the uh, the root ball from freezing. Planting tips. I think I've talked about this already. I, I don't think hydrangeas are are good foundations. They're not good against the house. Pull them away from the house. They could be tier two in a in a larger garden. We have something taller. You don't want them smacked up against your your siding, your foundation, your stone. You don't want to use, please avoid stone mulch because they're just going to absorb heat if that's what you have. And I actually have some stone in one part of my house when I first moved in and they're a little tiny stone, but I've scraped away the stone from the hydrangeas and they're doing okay, but they also, also aren't in, in sun. So stone and sun is, it's just going to stress your hydrangeas out. They're not going to do well. You want to avoid having them near um, an irrigation system where there's overhead sprinklers. You're just asking for problems, and I'll show you what they do. First year sleep, second year creep, third year leap, and that's pretty much true. They may take a year off in between here to just get some energy and get some oomph to them, but expect transplant shock. They're going to look, they've grown in ideal conditions. I have a pistachio that I bought. It was beautiful. It's about two and a half feet wide, loaded with blossoms, put it in the ground, did well that summer. This year it's coming back. Half of it's canes. It's half the size it was. That's because my soil isn't perfect. I, it wasn't grown in a greenhouse. It experienced Delaware weather. It didn't do that when it was in a nursery. No. It's doing it now because it's in the real world. So they're going to go through, oh, this is where I live now. Okay, well, I'm going to have to reserve some energy here and work on my root system. It's just going to, it's going to take time. So you have to be patient with them. Plant them in the right area. Um, again, people make mistakes. The biggest mistake is a macrophile in full sun and any kind of hydrangea right smack up against a house. They normally need to have three feet. So if you can't, if they're three feet away from your foundation of your house, you're okay. But if you've put that up six inches from your foundation, that hydrangea can't grow the way it was meant to grow. It's going to hit that wall. And then your siding, if you have light siding, that's going to reflect heat. So the sun's hitting the siding, it's going to reflect back. So you're actually exacerbating the situation. Um, so you just want to really think about, you know, if you're, there are people, oh, but I wanted blue macrophyllos at the front of my house. I, I wanted, I just saw a picture online and that's what I want. Yeah, but your front of your house faces south. I hate to tell you, it's not going to work. It's just, you're, you're not going to have the results you want. So certain things you just can't have. You know, you want to avoid these problems. So you want to be able to take care of them. This was at the Delaware State Fair. And they, of course, they just stick these in the ground in their pots and they cover it with mulch and they don't water them. And that's what's going to happen if you do that in full sun. So this was a hydrangea community that I participate. And she was like, why are my plants not doing well? They're starting to fade. And one, she bought a florist hydrangea. She bought this in in you know, April in full bloom. Well, it's been forced. So it's on its way down as far as performance for this year. But secondly, I hated to tell her, but my dear, you planted that way too close to the house. Look at those white bricks. You know, this hydrangea is always going to be stressed a little bit, needs to be moved away. So way too close to the house. And she purchased it in full bloom. So it's not going to stay that way for four months. It's you bought it at peak, it's on its way down. So 
that's another thing you don't want to do. Uh, Circosporia, Circospora um, leaf spot, very, very common problem. It's not fatal, but it doesn't look really well. The spores on this will overwinter on soft tissue. So if you want, if you have this, you can't get rid of it. You can remove the leaves. It still will do some photosynthesizing. But when it loses its leaves, you need to rake all this area and all of the living tissue and the leaves. You need to rake it out, completely rake it out, put some fresh mulch down and or maybe not even mulch over the winter. And then in the spring, you want to treat the shrub with a copper based fungicide. I would say starting in May, June, July on a regular basis, but watering from over top. Hydrangeas prefer to be water from the bottom. The only time water should touch these leaves is when it rains. But this is a very typical problem. And again, it won't kill the plant, but you, if you don't want this to repeat next year, you need to really clear the area really well. Look at um, thinning it out if you can, because good air circulation helps. Are you cramming your hydrangeas together? Are you cramming them into other landscapes or are you allowing air to circulate through? That's also very important. You know, just planning, this is the way my house is. So my front, I don't have a colonial, but my house faces south and this is southwest, this is north and here's east. So these are where these do best on the east side, southeast, east, southeast, maybe northeast. And eh, you, you, I have some over here, but this is the best area right here. Morning sun, sun rises here, sun sets over here. Paniculatus can go anywhere. And the arborescence is sort of like the wild card. I, I have some arborescence over here. I, you see this big tree? I have like a similar thing. So you could put an arborescence right here because when it, the sun starts to track across like this, this tree will cast some shade. So it has to, a lot has to do with what the rest of your canopy looks like in, in your landscape. So here's a mistake. This is one of my earliest mistakes. I did everything wrong here. So I have a gray, light gray house concrete, you know, stucco foundation there. I didn't put rocks down, so I did, at least I did that right. But everything else on this is, this is quite mature. This is, this I put, oh, I think I planted this about 15 years ago. And it looked lovely for a couple of years. It's starting to grow back because I have taller trees. I have a Deodora cedar in front of this so it's casting it's breaking up some of that southern exposure but it's way too close to the house so in July I'm gonna either dig this up and move it away and move it out I'm definitely going to prune it so I will come in and just reshape this it's time I may sacrifice a year of blossoms I hope I don't I hope I'll get some this is a reblooming one so I'm just going to come in. I'm going to see these old canes here. Those, yeah, I can tug on them and they'll just pull out. But I will in August because I don't want to invite cane borers. I will come in and just kind of strategically reshape this. Again, I might have to wait a year, but after that, it should, it should look a lot better because now I do have it protected from sun. This is what it used to look like. So it was, it was lovely at one point. This is the hydrangea cane borers I was talking to you about. Now, don't panic. A lot of hydrang hydrangeas, canes, when they age, will hollow out. But what we're looking for here is you'll see there's a hole there, there's a hole there, there's a hole there. That's because yours truly went and pruned the canes because I didn't like the way they looked. And I pruned them in May and the May. These ugly bare sticks sticking out. So I pruned it. And I invited in these cane borers. And here's what they look like. They're little black beetle, beetle flies. And they I, I took a cane out, cross-sectioned it, and a big black a fly flew out. And then there was all this larva in here. 
and they just go down, 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 down. You keep pruning until you get a solid cane, solid cut with no holes in it, and then seal it. Now, I don't know if this is cooperative extension indoors, but I seal it with, you can't use that black prune, tree pruning stuff. That's that's overboard. But I, I've used tacky glue because I just want that seal to be on there long enough for the to to not let the um the cane borers see get access so that their their life cycle in Delaware as far as I can tell is late May and early June so they're they're going to come in and the telltale sign is this crystally soft light fluffy and that what they're doing is that's the pith the xylem and the phloem and they're just getting that out of there so they can put their their cells in. So you don't want that. It will definitely impede the way that your shrub will transpire and 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 grow. You, you don't want to do that. So there, there's another, there's the larvae right there. Look at that. So when people are cane happy, when they're Edward Scissors hands and they don't do anything, this is what this is what you're inviting in. So you don't want to do that. Don't be Edward Scissors hands. If, if you are going to, because you absolutely can't stand the look, seal them up. So I used, this was Bloom's Blue. I used a little blue nail polish. It's not going to hurt the shrubs, I don't think. Um, that the, the cane borers aren't going to get in there. So I cut these out, out, out until I got solid surface up here. And then I sealed it. And you want to take these and you want to destroy them. Don't just let them drop to the ground because you're just going to have more of them next year. Um, you let, you know, get rid of these, put them, put them in a burn pit. Don't put them in a compost pit. This is what late frost damage. So that variegated uh, hydrangea that I showed you, this is it. This is that shrub. It's not variegated up at the top, but it is down at the bottom. But this is frost damage. Look at the blackness. So this was, we had a few days, of nice, warm, warm, wonderful weather in March. And then reality hit and the weather returned and boom. So I lost 10, 20% of possible blossoms because, because of this, because I didn't cover it. So that's what frost damage. If you see that, yeah, then you got to cut. And you, when you prune, there is a leaf node right there. So these little horizontal sections, that's where you, you just kind of come in like that. On a diagonal and cut. Black, see the black on the buds? Black, 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 black. They're all dead. But if you cut it and it's fresh pithy down here, and you, you're going to get those cane bores I'm talking about. So if you do remove this, you've got to seal that cut off so you don't get the cane bores. If you do it in July, you're fine. Some people, if you have a hydrangea that you don't know the hardiness of, like a gift hydrangea, a florist hydrangea, a Mother's Day hydrangea, and you plant it in the ground, you may need to do something like this where you have four wooden stakes and you can wrap it with burlap, you can wrap it with some kind of a cage, and a lot of people in zones five and six, they fill this all up with leaves. So they just, the leaves become the insulator. And then they take a little bit of it off in March or April when it starts to get reliably warmer so that the plant can start to photosynthesize a little bit. But be prepared to cover it if you get a we get a forecast of, of freezing weather. Is that... These florist hydrangeas do not have any winter protection for them. They, they just, snow's fine. It's, it's because they're dormant. So it can snow and it can be 32 degrees in, in January. You don't have to do this, but it's when the plant starts to emerge out of dormancy that it, it is its most vulnerable because it's starting to swell. It's starting to photosynthesize. It's starting to produce leaves and, and the buds, the future buds are starting to swell and then bam, that cold comes in. So this would be one thing you could do to save it. Uh, some people will cover their hydrangeas. So this is somebody using burlap and you might want to do something like that. A good idea. 
So any uh, disclaimer here, any use of brand names in this presentation are not an endorsement. I've mentioned the Spoma and I've mentioned Polytone. There are others. These are just the ones I use and or to illustrate that uh, there are options out there. A lot of people, a lot of brands will have the same characteristics, 10, 10, 10. You know, many people make that kind of uh, fertilizer. So this is just that we thank you for listening today. Thank you for being patient for those who watched this. Um, and I'm sorry that we had the tech technological snafus. I wanted to tell you that you have with this uh, resources, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's going to be a link in the description that's going to take you to these pages. And I'm just going to click that right now so that you see it. It's going to bring you to this folder which has my presentation in it. And it has uh, an essay that I did back in 2015 on how I got interested in hydrangeas and um, what I learned over the years. This is the Mount Cuba hydrangea report. This is a fact sheet on native hydrangeas for Delaware. So these are all my photographs. I wrote this one. So this is all about if you really want to stick to native hydrangeas on your property, I encourage you to do to include some of them, um, which varieties and, and how, how to take care, care of them. And then this is a sortable, this is provided by Mount Cuba, but it's a sortable list of their hydrangeas that were native. So these are all arborescence and the, the, the cultivar names and what whether they're lace cap or mop head and how to take care of them and when they bloom and their overall rating their height and their spread as well as their overall rating for pollinators specifically for pollinators so this is included you can also google this and you would get it um, but i just wanted to show you that so i think you'll find that that's very um interesting so i hope these resources are helpful for you. I'm trying to think if anybody asked me any other questions. Um, someone did ask about when to fertilize. You want to fertilize in March, so like two or three weeks before when things start to warm up, so two or three weeks in spring. And then uh, you want to fertilize along the drip edge. So what is a, what is a drip edge? Uh, uh, again, and also when watering, this is the crown. So that's the original, the original pot you brought it in and brought it in is right in here. But this is not where you necessarily want to water. It's certainly not where you want to pour your liquid fertilizer or your granule. You want to do it along. So as this plant has matured, the roots are now out here. This is called the drip edge. This is the area along the outermost part of the shrub. So I take a little hand rake and I rake all this out, and I essentially draw a circle all around this hydrangea, like that. And that's where I apply, I use holly tone, holly tone and rose tone, holly tone's a little bit more acidic, but any kind of granular slow release fertilizer is good, Osmocote, there's a whole bunch of them, but a lot, I will tell you that it's just a fact, a lot of hydrangea enthusiasts like holly tone or rose tone. And I just go in there with a hand, with a hand claw, hand rake, scratch a circle and sprinkle as according to the directions on the label, sprinkle that fertilizer in, water it down with a hose and we'll reapply that, I would say around July, because this hydrangea will start to fade by July and it starts to look eh. But it, what it's doing as the blooms begin to fade, it's, it is starting to manufacture new buds in its leaf nodes. So when it's doing that, they could benefit from a little extra fertilizer. I wouldn't fertilize in the fall, not in the winter. So I would say March and July to do that. So that's the drip edge. That was one of the questions that I got. I'm trying to answer, think if there were any others. If you do, have any more questions because I've gone on and on. And my original presentation was long too. 
I just want to tell you, if you go online to some of the stores, this is Proven Winners, you can see all the different varieties. And if you click on these, this is just a screenshot. If you click on them, they're going to tell you whether they need to be in how far apart they should be, where you should, what kind of room they're going to need, how they're going to, what their size they're going to peak at, what's their sun requirement, what's their zone requirement. So I find these are really helpful. And I look at these and drool over them and go, oh, you know what? I think I really want to try and get myself uh, like this Invincible lime. This is an arborescence. That's telling me it's native. It's a smooth hydrangea. They stay limey, limey green. I did, I picked up some um, Mauvettes, mini Mauvette, and I picked up a Incredible Blush. So you can kind of go through Monrovia, and this one's Monrovia's, and look at them. This is, I typed in my zone, put in my zip code, and these were the ones they suggested, suggested as doing well. So I write ones down that I think I might have. I bought the Munchkin. Some I'd never heard of, and they keep coming out with new ones every year. They're like 30, 40 new ones. And um, so look at that Newport. Look at the purple on that. So that's what you uh, that's what you have to do is just kind of, I think that's a really good way to learn about the different varieties and what the inflorescence might look like. Just understand that it takes a good two, three, sometimes even four years before they look the way they look when you first bought them or the way they look in the catalog. Uh, a lot of them will have transplant shock and that's that's normal. And I just wanted to share, this was my mother's hydrangea that I was telling you about. This is the very first hydrangea I planted against the front of my house. And it really suffered. After 21 years, I went, well, uh, 20 years, I decided, you know what? I'm going to give it one last chance in a new home. So I, well, my husband, bless his heart, he dug this up. They're not that terribly deep-rooted. I will tell you that. It's not like a Versidia. So I, we, we dug it up relatively easy. This broke into two pieces. And, and it had each had roots on it. So I prepared in deep shade two big, large holes. And I really went out and I went because this was sentimental to me because it was by, at my mother's funeral. I went out and bought, you know, black cow compost and leaf grow and dug a big hole, and super big hole and backfilled it all in. And it's coming back. Now, this was the second, it's second year. I'm going to prune all of this out in August so that this can really work on itself next year. The second piece, of which I didn't photograph, the second piece, it's blooming. I had 10 blooms on it. So it was a smaller piece, less, it's just less struggle, I guess. But I was able to save it. So you can move them to a better location. If you make a mistake, you can do that. Just understand that it may interrupt the blooming cycle for two or three years before you get anything. And um, I'm thrilled that I haven't killed it and that it, it, it is going to come back. And, and the one, the other one definitely has. So um, I think mom, if she's, if she's looking, she's, she's happy to say that I, I didn't give up on it. So that's it. This is my email. If you have questions, I also have a, um, if you, download this or you'll have access to this presentation if you put it into slideshow mode um you'll be able to click on them this will take you to my Flickr account these are all of my hydrangeas and these are all the license has been relaxed on them so you're welcome to use them if you were going to do a book a portal on hydrangeas these are all the hydrangeas i have in my property and um, I got 11 pages. I'm not going to bore you through 11 pages of them, but um, videos, this is pistachio. And in most cases, I've had to put umbrellas up to, to give them some shade where I've had to cut down. This was my mother's hydrangea. This was the year I decided, look at that sick looking thing. I decided I had tried shade cloth. I was trying everything. 
And eventually that's, this is what prompted me to say, you know what, I'm either going to have to say goodbye to it, but before I do that, I'm going to give it one more chance. So that's what you just saw on the other one. So uh, they're all here. I, I try to describe uh, what they are and, um, and what, uh, there's a little quick fire and, oh, God, we're back into other things now. So anyway, I hope you find that that's helpful. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm back on and I hope you found this useful. And in, definitely, if you've inherited something that's not performing well, reconsider moving it. I would say the best time to move, you don't want to do it in August. You want to wait to maybe September. That's a good time to dig it up. Uh, either that or in the spring, very early spring, March would be good if you've got a problem with hydrangea. Uh, but basically experiment. Go out and try Put a couple natives, put an arborescence or an oak leaf in. It's going to do well in your landscape. And they tend to be, again, more tolerant of shade, sun, mix, mixture, than even full sun. And uh, the macrophiles are the ones you have to be careful of and just understand the different types, different categories, different reasons they're grown. And um, if you try to put a gift hydrangea in the front of your house and it's sunny, and it's never going to do well, but it might do beautifully as a container plant. So those, I hope, hopefully I clarified some of that for you in this presentation. Good luck and contact me if you have any questions about anything I've said here today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.